My name is Wyatt Houston Day, and I'm the head of the African American Department at Swan Galleries. There are over 370 lots in this sale. We uh, cover everything from slavery and abolition, art and illustrated books, literature, poetry, fiction, military, music, photography, with some additional material on the Black Panthers, Marcus Garvey, civil rights, Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, movie posters, uh, some scientific material. It's its 12th sale of this material here at Swan, and it also marks the 200th anniversary of the abolition of the African slave trade. We have a, a rather large section, approximately 100 lots, this year on slavery and abolition, which is an enormous span of time when you think fr from the 16th century to the end of the 19th. But uh, I'd like to begin to talk about the first piece in the sale, Lot 1, is from 1557. It's by far the earliest piece we've ever had that deals directly with Africans in the Americas or Africans in the diaspora. And the piece is a uh, manuscript document from Peru. It's signed by the Marques de Cañete. This particular document deals with a group of idle blacks, is the way it's referred to in the document. These are uh, Africans that, through either working through their, their bondage or making a deal with the Spanish crown on one level or another, attained their freedom. These blacks very often weren't working. These, uh, these people were, had their freedom, but the, there was really nothing they could do to earn a living. And in this case, the governor orders them to a, a region called Carabaya, where gold had been discovered, or thought to have been discovered. As it turned out, the mines were very unproductive, but what happened was that these particular Africans went to that region and developed farming, and they employed local Incans, and they married local Incans. And so within a few years, a community called San Juan de Oro was uh, established, and there were 40 heads of household by 1560. What is particularly significant about this document is the fact that it establishes the fact that there were free blacks in the Americas as early as 1557, something which is certainly not widely known and that certainly affects the further history, the colonial history, and affects the history of Africans in the Americas. Next, I'd like to call your attention to uh, Lot 3, and that's a journal book for Africa. And that's a logbook of the slave ships Betsy and Sally for the years 1765 to 1767. This is highly unusual. Uh, what known logbooks for slave ships are mostly in institutions and very, very rarely uh, come on the market. I, I know of none that have ever been on the auction market. The present... Uh, log covers pretty much what you'd expect, same as a whaling log book. It has a lot of uh, navigational entries. The logs are significant for a number of reasons. There are uh, indications of slaves that, that perish along the way, and we know that the worst part of this whole ugly business is the Middle Passage, where part of the accepted losses was approximately one-third of their cargo. They expected to die in the passage. So this is a very significant lot. I would expect uh, an institution to be interested in this. I'd certainly hope so. Lot 12, this is a document signed by President Franklin Pierce. It's a pardon. And it's, as far as the research I've been able to do, this is the only known presidential pardon under the Fugitive Slave Act. This is a pardon for a man named Hansen, convicted of harboring slaves, and he was sentenced to pay a fine of $1,080. Now, that's a tremendous sum of money in 1854, the date of this. And, of course, he couldn't pay it, so he was jailed. And here's a catch-22, so while he's in jail, he certainly can't earn money to pay it off, so he sits in jail. 
Someone must have advocated for him, and President Pierce pardons him with this document. It's signed by President Pierce, and uh, this is a uh, very important document. It's uh, a unique document as far as we can tell. As I mentioned, this is the 200th anniversary of the abolition of the slave trade, the African slave trade in 1807. And we have uh, Lot 67, Africa, America. This piece was uh, commissioned and created to commemorate the end of the slave trade. It's uh, a strangely naive piece in many ways. There's an African native who looks almost like a, a Native American. He has a quiver over his shoulder and a big feather headdress that looks more like a, uh, a Sioux than a West African native. Opposite him is a uh, Britannia, a very uh, stylized version of Britannia holding the American flag in one hand and on the other her hand is resting on a portrait of Thomas Clarkson and William Wilberforce, two of the most significant figures in uh, the abolition of the slave trade. Both of them worked all their lives uh, to put an end to the slave trade. Lot 69, Philadelphia, Wilmington, Baltimore Railroad, notice to all colored people. What it says essentially is that all colored people, bond or free, wishing to travel on the Philadelphia, Wilmington and Baltimore Railroad will be required to bring with them to the ticket office, President Street Depot, some responsible white person. This broadside was no doubt born out of the complex Passmore-Williamson case and other precedents brought about by the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. In 1855, John Hill Wheeler was en route to New York on a boat that had docked at the port of Philadelphia. He had with him his slave Jane and her two children. Abolitionist Passmore Williamson slipped aboard the boat with five free blacks as accomplices and after creating a diversion was able to urge Jane and her children to leave the boat. Once on Pennsylvania soil, according to Pennsylvania law, they were free. Wheeler, however, brought suit against Williamson and the state. The case now became a real cause celebre and dragged on for years. Both steamship companies and railroads instituted rules such as the stated one in this broadside to avoid being entangled in litigation. We could find no reference to this poster anywhere. As far as we know, it, it may be unique. There are several important civil rights pieces in the, in the catalog. Lot 158 is a very early Jim Crow law, North Carolina law, and this provided for separate accommodations of white and colored passengers on motor buses. This is circa 1907 from Raleigh, North Carolina. This is a very early Jim Crow, formal Jim Crow law. Lot 159, a relic of the Jim Crow era. This is a water fountain um, from probably in 1940s or 50s, which has the simple message stenciled on it, white. And uh, this was part of some public facility in the South. Very few of these things really remain. Most of them just uh, when these places were torn down or after the civil rights legislation forbidding this kind of segregation, these things were destroyed or replaced.